In my culture, death is not the end. It's my of a stepping off point. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my full Black Panther Wakanda Forever breakdown and Easter eggs for the entire movie. There is a whole bunch of stuff that they set up during this we have to talk about. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. And careful for spoilers for the movie if you haven't seen it yet. But we'll just start at the beginning, work our way through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs, WTF moments, and all the teasers for the upcoming movies. The whole opening scene of the movie is meant to be T'Challa's actual death, with Shuri trying to find a way to recreate the heart-shaped herb using science, claiming that taking the herb again will be able to heal whatever's killing him. I know this is going to be a huge question, like what did he actually die from in the MCU? They never actually reference what it is. They only say that he lived with a disease for a long time, secretly not telling any of his family members except for Nakia. He told Nakia after she became pregnant with their son, also named T'Challa, his Haitian name he goes by is Toussaint, in order to hide his identity. The other big easter egg for the comics here is that in the comics, Black Panther's son is with Storm, his name is Azari, and he gets both Storm's powers and becomes the next Black Panther and has all of his powers. His mutant powers are basically the same as Storm's powers. He has electrokinesis. I'm assuming the version of the MCU is just going to be a normal human until he takes the heart-shaped herb. It is always possible that they do introduce a version of Storm, though, in Black Panther 3, because she is queen of her tribe in Africa. So if there were any movie to introduce her in, the Black Panther movies would be the place to do it. I think the mystery disease is just meant to be a parallel for Chadwick Boseman's death in real life, secretly having cancer through the filming of all of his Marvel movies back to the events of Captain America's Civil War. That was around the time when he actually was diagnosed with cancer and he just kept it to himself like he didn't tell the Marvel people, he didn't tell any of his fans, maybe his wife knew about it, but that's about it. When he was filming the first Black Panther movie, the Avengers Infinity War, Avengers Endgame movies, he was suffering through cancer and it was really bad at that point. Later in the movie, she does wind up being able to use Namor's underwater strain of the heart-shaped herb, another type of plant that grew in underwater vibranium-tainted soil that would have saved him. But it also enables her to become the next Black Panther and will also allow T'Challa's son to become the next Black Panther after her when he comes of age later. And possibly even meet his father in the ancestral plane. I know there's all kinds of theories about what they could do with T'Challa's character or how they'd use him in future stories because Chadwick Boseman is dead. They're not going to bring him back in a really big way, but they could always say that he does become the new Panther God if they kill off the boss, Panther Goddess. There are a couple different times in the comics when Black Panther actually does become a god. Speaking of gods, another big thing we've been talking about this year in the Marvel movies and Marvel Disney Plus series are the way the gods exist in the MCU. Thor Love and Thunder, Moon Knight, Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness. And one of the most surprising things to me in this opening scene was that we were learning for the first time that Shuri never really believed in Boss the Panther Goddess. She never thought that she was real because as a last resort, she finally praised to her saying that I will finally believe in you if you help save my brother. But the thing is, is that us as the audience saw Bost in Thor Love and Thunder. We know that Bost is real. We've seen Thor. Thor is an actual god in the MCU, so we know that gods actually exist. So it was kind of weird to me that Shuri did not believe that gods exist. She also didn't believe her mother when she was talking about the ancestral plane. I've seen visions of your brother. She was talking about seeing T'Challa in the ancestral plane. Early in the movie, Shuri brushed that off, claiming that it was just a trick of her mother's mind. Like, you weren't really seeing our brother. I think the point at which she starts to believe, though, is when she actually takes the new version of the heart-shaped herb and sees Killmonger. She travels to the ancestral plane like, oh, this is all real. One of the other big introductions during this intro scene is her new AI. It's actually voiced by Trevor Noah. You probably recognize the voice. Later, her mother even has an Ultron reference when she starts joking about the AI going rogue. Shuri's like, no, it's totally safe. It does whatever I tell it to do. But we know that's not totally true because we know all about Ultron, Avengers Age of Ultron. They never reference this plot point again during the movie, the AI itself going rogue, so they might just be setting up a future plot line that they'll pay off in some other movie. Maybe Black Panther 3, maybe something else. The whole idea that Shuri has too much faith in her technology, it's the same thing that happened to Iron Man during Avengers Age of Ultron. Too curious and too smart for your own good sometimes, like curiosity killed the cat, and that metaphor makes so much more sense now in the context of Black Panther because she is kind of like a cat. A really big, really stabby cat. But the whole movie is full of moments like this with like little beats that feel like they're setting up something really huge in the future that they never fully pay off by the end of the movie. Like we're going to take care of this in a future movie. During T'Challa's funeral at the beginning, the reason why they're wearing white and white seems kind of like a party for some of them is because in a lot of cultures around the world they wear white to funerals instead of black, particularly that part of Africa. 
And the reason they're celebrating is because they're celebrating T'Challa's life while mourning him at the same time. Like through the process of mourning, they are celebrating his life. Thematically, the entire movie is written to be awake for T'Challa and Shuri learning to grieve him and then per their customs, move on with the future. And for most of the movie, she can't do that. Like she can't move on. The reason why they take T'Challa's body away in the ship is because inside Wakanda, they bury the previous kings inside the necropolis. They call it the City of the Dead. We saw it in the first movie. That's where they kept the heart-shaped herb before Killmonger burned it. Inside the necropolis, they have a very special place for the actual previous Black Panthers, the previous kings. They call it literally the Hall of Kings. Once young T'Challa comes of age, we'll probably see him in that place looking at his father's tomb. In the comics, Black Panther also gains the power to speak to the previous Black Panthers. It's kind of like Avatar the Airbender, where they can summon up the past lives and learn from their knowledge. They might wait till his son comes of age and becomes the next Black Panther before they pay off that plot point, though. They have the special tribute version of Marvel Studios' intro logo with just Chadwick Boseman. They did the same thing for Stan Lee after he passed away, like the Stan Lee version of the intro scene. The other difference with the Black Panther version is that it's totally silent. They don't play the Marvel fanfare like they did with Stan Lee. They have a one year time jump. So that means that T'Challa died about two years after Avengers Endgame. And the majority of the movie is meant to take place about three years after Avengers Endgame, around the same time as Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, because there's an Easter egg for Scott Lang's book that we see during Ant-Man Quantumania. It's called Look Out for the Little Guy and it's on one of the Chirons. They did the same thing during Spider-Man No Way Home with an Easter egg for Thor Love and Thunder. There was a reference to New Asgard during one of J. Jonah Jameson's Daily Bugle news broadcasts. At the United Nations, we learned the rest of the world is pissed off at Wakanda and they want their vibranium, their resources, because they're still kind of in rebuilding mode after Avengers Endgame. This becomes a big plot point for Val's character and they'll probably pay it off during Captain America 4 New World Order and the Thunderbolts movie because Val wants vibranium and she very literally told Everett Ross, I dream of the time when America controls all vibranium on the planet. Richard Schiff is playing the new Secretary of State. He took over for Thunderbolt Ross. He used to be the Secretary of State back during the events of Captain America Civil War, which is why I think they wanted to recast Thunderbolt Ross with Harrison Ford and use him in a big way during Captain America 4 because he'll be a big part of that. We meet Anika for the first time. She's a member of the Midnight Angels. She's also from the comics. They debut in the movie with Shuri's new suits that she and Okoye wear. And if it wasn't clear, Anika is also meant to be Ayo's lover. Ayo also winds up becoming the new general, the new leader of the Dora Milaje, taking over for Okoye when she gets fired during the movie. We find out that the United States government essentially tricked Riri Williams' Ironheart character into creating a vibranium detector, which the United States has been using to try and find underwater vibranium. There's been a lot of theories about what's going on behind this. I think this is where we get to our Doctor Doom plot and Easter eggs in the MCU. In the movie, Riri Williams says she doesn't know anything about the U.S. government being involved with her vibranium detector. She just created it because one of her MIT professors dared her to do it. And she just thought that she was doing it for a class assignment. They never referenced the professor by name, but it's the professor who tricked her and then sold it to the U.S. government. I think the professor is probably going to wind up being the leader. Some of you asked if Dr. Doom would wind up being the mystery professor, but I don't think that he would secretly be a professor at MIT. But here's the thing, Lake Bell in the movie is supposed to be playing a version of Lucia von Barda, who is like Dr. Doom's right-hand person from Lotberia. In the movie, she's only credited as Dr. Graham and they never reference her by name, but she's much too big of an actor and in such a seemingly small one-off role to be just a nobody. So I think the idea is that Dr. Doom is searching for vibranium, just like the Americans are, and he's using her as a plant inside the United States government. So it's sort of Dr. Doom pulling the strings from behind. So you have Val and Thunderbolt Ross trying to get their hands on vibranium, but really it's Dr. Doom playing them for fools, tooting his horn from the shadows, so to speak. They never mention him by name in the movie, but the whole world versus Wakanda plot over vibranium in the movie is them adapting some of the Doom War storyline from the comics where he literally invades Wakanda to steal their vibranium. Also, Shuri becoming the next Black Panther happened right after the Doom War arc. So there are a lot of Doctor Doom Easter eggs happening in the movie, but nobody actually mentions him by name. It's always possible that he could come back and be a much bigger villain during Black Panther 3 or they'll probably use him in some other way in the MCU. There's rumors about more Easter eggs for him during the Ironheart series because Ironheart season 1 is meant to be all about the balance between magic and technology and that is like core Doctor Doom, man of science, man of magic. But I don't think the Doctor Doom character is supposed to actually be in the Ironheart series. They're just slowly establishing him in the MCU. Like you'll see Easter eggs for him in the background. 
And at the end of the movie, when Shuri tells Namor that she'll help protect his underwater vibranium from the rest of the world and Riri Williams isn't going to create any more vibranium detectors, it essentially means the United States, Doctor Doom, anyone else is out of luck for vibranium unless they invade Wakanda short term. Which I think they'll pay off with Val in the Thunderbolts trying to get vibranium in the Thunderbolts movie, maybe Captain America 4. I am sure once it gets to that, Bucky will have something to say about it. Like, there's no way Bucky would willingly want to invade Wakanda because he owes them so much. But I think that'll just be part of the drama, like the whole idea that they'll be forced to fight them and Bucky will have to go rogue. That's one of the reasons why Val told US Agent that she would need him because she couldn't call on real Captain America, the Falcon version, for some of these things. Obviously, he wouldn't want to invade Wakanda, but US Agent wouldn't have a problem with that. We meet the MCU version of Atlanteans for the first time, but remember, some big changes about their backstory. Now they're based more on Mayan, Aztec culture, and their city isn't Atlantis, it's Talocan. They didn't change their backstory or Namor's backstory for rights reasons or anything like that. They just wanted it to feel like a real culture inside the world, like it could have happened the same way that a lot of the other Marvel stuff, and mostly so that it didn't feel like a copy of the Aquaman movie. Just like Boss the Panther Goddess came to Bashenga and told him where to find the heart-shaped herb about 10,000 years ago, Namor's god came to his mother's people about 500 years ago and did the same thing for them with the underwater heart-shaped herb. We actually do see the god of Namor's people in Thor Love and Thunder. He's sitting right next to Boss, the god of Black Panther's people, or some of Black Panther's people. Not all of them worship the Panther Goddess. For instance, M'Baku comes from the ape tribe. They worship the ape god. He even invokes his name during the movie, praying to him. A lot of you have also asked if Namor's underwater vibranium meteorite is the same meteorite that killed the dinosaurs or the same one that brought Tiamat to planet Earth. It's not the one that killed the dinosaurs because that one fell in the Gulf of Mexico. It Atlantis is supposed to be here in the Atlantic on Nick Fury's map much closer to where Wakanda is. It is possible that this is part of the seed that brought Tiamat to planet Earth like that's where the vibranium came from and just pieces of it broke off and one went to Wakanda and one went to the Atlantic Ocean because Celestials in the comics do use vibranium to make their bodies. It changed their physiology to what it is now, but his mother was pregnant with him when she took it, and he was born a mutant, around the 1500s. That's why I said he's meant to be about 500 years old when the movie begins. So he has a bunch of extra powers, like all of his comic book powers, but they're because he's a mutant, not because of the heart-shaped herb, which is why the Atlanteans don't all have the same powers that he does. Currently, this makes him the oldest mutant in the MCU that we've seen so far. Apocalypse and Selene are older mutants in the comics, but because we haven't seen versions of them in the MCU yet, technically Namor is the oldest one so far. And essentially, he's a Mesoamerican Aztec Mayan version of comic book Namor. He also says his trademark catchphrase from the comics later in the movie, Imperius Rex. Loosely, it translates to Latin meaning Empire King. He uses it as his battle cry, kind of like Wakandans say Wakanda forever before they start attacking. He's got organic wings on his feet. He can fly. The way that he talks about it, though, it's swimming through the sky. That's also the way they visualize his flying, too. It looks like he's literally swimming through the sky. Just like in the comics, he's about as strong as the Hulk when he's in contact with water. That is a comic book thing. When he's not, he's still very strong, just not nearly as strong. All the regular citizens of Talokan are basically kind of like low-level super soldiers because their DNA has been changed by the heart-shaped herb. Like every single member of their culture is like a low-level super soldier. They're way stronger than normal, they heal faster, which is why they're so formidable against the Wakandans, which is why Namor says, you cannot stand against my army. When they meet Namor for the first time at the beach, the shell that he gives them is also just another comic book reference. Don't toot the horn unless you mean business. Namor also tells them that his mother told him stories about Wakanda when he was young, almost 500 years ago. Just charting the timeline of Wakanda within the MCU, Bashanga, the first Black Panther, was born about 10,000 years ago, so Wakanda would have existed for a long time already by then. Inside the throne room, there's a cool Easter egg tribute to Chadwick Boseman in real life on the inscriptions around the pillars in the room. Decoded, they all say, rest in power, King T'Challa, our hero, it has been an honor, Wakanda forever. They bring back the Everett Ross character. He's listening to Red Hot Chili Peppers. He helps them rescue Riri Williams, and they use a lot of his storyline with Val to set up Thunderbolts in the Captain America 4 movie. We learn that he used to be married to Val, and when Okoye rescues him from prison at the end of the movie, that's more of a setup for Secret Invasion because Martin Freeman, Everett Ross, will be back in Secret Invasion working with Nick Fury. Obviously, is a fugitive now because he's still supposed to be in prison. We meet Riri Williams, who goes to MIT like Tony Stark, like Spider-Man was trying to get into MIT. In fact, because this happens a little bit after the events of Spider-Man No Way Home, 
MJ and Ned Leeds might actually be going here at this point. Obviously, because Riri Williams' Iron Heart is so connected to Iron Man in the comics or origin story, there are a lot of Iron Man references and Easter eggs during her scenes. Shuri references Stark Tech a few times. Her Mark I is meant to be kind of like Iron Man's Mark I. You see her banging with the hammer the exact same way that he did. She even has her own version of the cave scene where they bust out of her garage like Iron Man busted out of the cave. Her first flight is meant to be similar to Iron Man's first flight in his Mark II with the joke about the oxygen levels and the suit kind of conking out until it got close to falling to the ground. And at the end of the movie, Shuri winds up helping her build her Mark II suit out of vibranium but makes her leave the suit in Wakanda when she goes back. The Ironheart series is meant to be a direct sequel to the events of Black Panther Wakanda Forever. She has her Mark III suit during that and now we know why because Shuri wouldn't let her take the vibranium suit with her. Inside her dorm room, the flag above her bed is the flag of Chicago in United States. That's where she's from. It's probably where most of the Ironheart series is going to take place. When Everett Ross finds Shuri's Kamoyo beads, Val reveals she bugged them because she knew about his connection with Wakanda and expected him to speak with them on the DL and wanted to play on that to see if she could get any more information. And it's just a way to show you that Val is way smarter and way more devious than she comes off because she's kind of a jokey character. When Ramonda fires Okoye as General the Dora Milaje, the real reason they had her do that obviously is to set up the Okoye Disney Plus series. They have to have a reason for her to leave Wakanda in the Dora Milaje. Also, she's going to continue being one of the Midnight Angels with Anika. You also notice that Ramonda says her entire family is gone, not dead, because she always knew this whole time about T'Challa's son. So even if Shuri had died during the movie, her entire family would not be dead. She'd have her grandson. When Shuri and Riri Williams are taken to Talo Can, she makes a bunch of pop culture references. Even Spider-Man would be proud of her. Princess Leia in Empire Strikes Back because she changed her clothes in Empire Strikes Back. Belle from Beauty and the Beast. The white chick from Indiana Jones is a reference to Raiders of the Lost Ark with Marion changing her clothes at the end of the movie. Like when someone is asked to change their clothes, something bad always follows. The underwater entrance to Talokan is also meant to be similar to the security methods that Wakanda has about getting through the shield. They have a special underwater current that they have to unleash first, which acts as sort of like a slipstream that they travel through that takes them to the actual city. And what they're looking at here is just the capital. The empire itself is much bigger, but the giant orb that emits all that light, sort of like your makeshift sun that comes out, is made entirely of vibranium. When Namor explains his full backstory to Shuri, he explains his name Namor in the MCU version is meant to be a translation of his language meaning no love because he has no love for the surface dwellers. In the comics, the reason why his name is Namor is because it's just Roman spelled backwards. Then when Namor winds up flooding Wakanda, that's meant to be an adaptation of when he did it in the comics during the Phoenix arc. It's basically the same situation, like he just flooded the entire city, killing a whole bunch of people. After Namor kills Ramonda, Shuri uses the remnants of Namor's heart-shaped herb to recreate it using her lab and uses it to become the next Black Panther. Just like she became the next Black Panther after the Doom War arc in the comics. Another big Doctor Doom connection. When she enters the ancestral plane, the reason why she winds up in the throne room is because she thought that she would see her mother and that's the place where her mother died. The reason why it winds up being Killmonger is because of her desire for revenge against Namor. Like Killmonger says, inside your heart, subconsciously, you really wanted me. That's why you called to me. It also winds up proving the reality of the ancestral plane and all this mystical stuff that she didn't totally believe in before this. When she creates her version of the Black Panther suit, because it's so inspired by Killmonger, that's why it has all the gold all over it. Like it's a combination of T'Challa's Black Panther suit and Killmonger's flashier Golden Jaguar suit. It's also why her suit seems so stabby looking. The mask has the same tribal markings on it that she has on her face, and it functions a lot like Iron Man's Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame nanite armors. Like the suit just creates anything she needs at any given moment using vibranium nanites. The only difference from Iron Man's armors is that he didn't have vibranium. That's why she can automatically form the same sonic cannons around her hands, like the fixed ones she wore in the first Black Panther movie. And when the armor isn't deployed, like the full suit, it exists inside that golden necklace that she wears that you see at the end of the movie. T'Challa's and Killmonger's also came out of their necklaces too. When she returns to M'Baku and the rest of the elders in the new Black Panther suit, it's important to note that M'Baku is on the same page with Shuri and wants to help her, despite their initial disagreement over killing Namor and starting a never-ending war. Even though he's going to be king now, at the end of the movie, when he says Shuri will not be joining us today, it's because he and Shuri already worked out the details of how Wakanda would be managed going forward, so there's already like a very clear understanding between the two of them how this is going to work. 
he would take over the rulership of Wakanda day-to-day -day stuff and she would just continue being Black Panther working in her lab. At least until T'Challa's son comes of age and combines those two roles again, like the King of Wakanda and the Black Panther at the same time. We get the Namor Imperius Rex mention and then Shuri sees a vision of her mother in the ancestral plane, finally, who urges her to show compassion, like show him who you really are. They come to an agreement, call truce, and Shuri agrees that Wakanda going forward will help them protect their underwater vibranium from the rest of the world. But the whole thing with Namor's ending scene when he's talking to Namora is that he's just biding his time waiting for the rest of the surface world like Val for instance, Doctor Doom, to invade Wakanda to get their vibranium hoping that it will force Shuri's hand to form an alliance with them and then they can burn down the rest of the world. M'Baku formally becomes king in the same ceremony that we saw during the first Black Panther movie. Riri Williams goes home to Chicago and to her Ironheart series. Okoye rescues Everett Ross so that he can go help Nick Fury during the Secret Invasion series. I believe those episodes will drop around March next year. It'll be like the first Marvel Disney Plus series of 2023. We'll get a new trailer for that really soon, so of course I'll do more bonus videos when we do. And we get our big post credit scene where we learn about T'Challa's son. I've already done a really big video about this, so I'll link it at the end of this and down in the description below. But the basic idea is that Marvel is now just going to make him the new Black Panther and the new King of Wakanda once he becomes old enough. He'll also probably be on Young Avengers teams. We'll see him in a bunch of other movies while he's slowly growing up. The big question now is whether or not Marvel is going to pull some timey-wimey, crazy, quantum mania type of trick with Kang to age him up super fast. Like, will he come of age in Black Panther 3 relatively soon? Or will it be Black Panther 4 or some other movie after that? Post all your theories about that, like how long is Marvel going to wait before young T'Challa is old enough to become the next Black Panther? You also probably recognize during the end credits, they also play Rihanna's song that she wrote just for the movie. And they have a special tribute to Chadwick Boseman T'Challa when Shuri is doing her grieving ceremony, like finally burning her garments from his funeral. There's like a billion things that happen during this movie that we can talk about. I have a bunch of bonus videos planned and obviously there's a bunch of other big stuff coming up too. Like Ant-Man 3 Quantumania is the next big movie. So there'll be more trailers for that later this year too. So there'll be a bunch of Kang videos coming. Everyone click here for that Black Panther Wakanda Forever post credit scene video and click here for my Ant-Man 3 Quantumania trailer video. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.